Today's New Testament lesson comes from Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The book of Acts is actually the second half of one work. Um, It's called Luke-Acts. So the Gospel of Luke is actually the first half to this one manuscript. um, And the second half half is the Acts of the Apostles. And this year, the lectionary... So let's just do lectionary, describe lectionary again. Lectionary is a scribe text that a whole bunch of different Christian denominations use. It cycles every three years, and um, every week there's like some kind of gospel lesson and an epistle lesson and a psalm and an Old Testament lesson, and there's a little variation on that. So this year, the year that we're in, the entire season of Lent was really focused on the gospel of Luke um, and not the other three gospels. Though, I mean, on Easter, you touch on on John almost, almost every Easter, but... We spent most of the time in Luke during Lent, and it makes sense that now that we're into the Easter season, the lectionary is focusing on Acts, the second half of the same manuscript. Um, And that's a pretty cool thing. So uh, I'm not really doing like a sermon series per se, but I'm going to be focusing on the book of Acts because that's where the lectionary is for the next few weeks throughout the Easter season. So Easter runs from last Sunday until... We hit Pentecost in the middle of May, Um, which kind of makes things a little bit strange as far as how you preach this, (laughs) because Pentecost, which comes in the middle of May, is when the Holy Spirit is given to the people. But scripturally, that actually takes place at the beginning of the book of Acts. That's in like the first and second chapter, and we're kind of jumping into chapter five of Acts. So we're going to start at chapter five of Acts and walk through the book of Acts, and then on Pentecost Sunday, we'll jump right back to the very beginning of the book of Acts. Um, so, so because of that, we kind of have to catch up with what has happened to the disciples since just last week, since Easter Sunday. So Jesus had been killed, right? And then Jesus rose from that death. And the disciples were still cowering in some upper room, afraid of the authorities who were supposedly after them. They didn't know exactly what to do with themselves. And then Jesus appears to them for a bit, and then Jesus leaves, and the Holy Spirit is given to the people. And this Holy Spirit is so amazing that these same guys who were cowering in the upper room are now really ready to go and change the world. This giving of the Holy Spirit is kind of a crucial understanding in the book of Acts um, because the Holy Spirit is very tricky. And so I'm going to spend a lot of today talking about the Holy Spirit uh, because it will feed into the next few weeks of what we're talking about in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit is tricky. Theologians, people that think and write about God, are kind of now just getting around to writing about the Holy Spirit. Like, we're finally finally there. Um, For centuries, our tradition has been trying to talk about who God is. Does God change? Is God affected by us, right? And then also who Jesus is. Um, That's really where we've been the most hung up. Is Jesus fully human? Is Jesus fully divine? Is Jesus both of these things? How can Jesus be both of these things? What is the relationship between Jesus and God? Um, And so these questions about Christ have kind of been our our main focus 
And the Holy Spirit was just kind of this afterthought um, in the academy, but also in the church for a long time. When we were making doctrine, the discussion was always about Jesus and about God. And then we would just tag on the Holy Spirit at the end of like, oh yeah, that's God too. Um, And that makes sense that we'd get caught up in the figure of Jesus because there's so much to wonder about when we think about Jesus. Um, And and there's also a lot to argue about, which the early church did for a long time and the church continues to do. There's also this other thing that scholars bring up about why we don't talk about the Holy Spirit. Um, A lot of that has to do with the Holy Spirit being understood as mostly feminine for a long time and the church not really wanting to talk about that or deal with that and to bring that to the attention of the public or into their work. Um, the feminine, feminine concepts were often considered like l- dirty or less than. Um, and if you deal with the spirit, you're gonna have to deal with like bodies and nature. And people weren't really interested in going <laughs> like that deep on those topics. That is, until science made talking about bodies and nature pretty cool. And we had new things we had to think about with the way that nature works and the ways that bodies work. And when we started learning about that stuff, when we started thinking about scientific stuff as as a people on this planet, we had new ways to talk about God. And so usually people that are writing about the Holy Spirit these days are also writing about physics. And they're writing about bodies. And they're writing about global warming. And they're writing or climate change. They're writing about things that take place in the natural world, which is fascinating and wonderful. So I just wanted to kind of point out uh, that we're kind of living in this time period right now where biblical scholars and theologians are really getting into this conversation about the Holy Spirit. And that the book of Acts is filled with glimpses about the nature of the Holy Spirit and how it manifests in our lives and in our world. One of the big things that we learn about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is that though it is a vehicle for God to work through people, it does not make people God. And that's a really important distinction um, because that means that in the book of Acts, the human, the people, are still very limited and they're still very human, and they're still very broken and problematic. It becomes astonishingly clear very quickly how human they remain. God has given these people the Holy Spirit, and Jesus has given the apostles the power to do great works, to do healings and such, right? But none of that promises that these guys are any less human. Right around the time that, uh, in chapter 5 here, there's a, there's a story where, Um, the apostles are walking down the street and people are trying to just put themselves into the shadow of the apostles and they'll be healed, right? So God has given them this great power, but they are still the same old ragtag bunch of humans that they have always been. In many ways, the book of Acts shows this kind of holiness of God and the lack there found in the disciples, the lack of holiness, And what I mean is that even though the disciples have been given this authority to do great works in the name of God, they're not given the kind of authority that we give Jesus. They're still just people, and we need to remember that. So let's go to our scripture for today, because there's beaming examples of the humanity, the problematic humanity of the apostles in this story. So Peter and the other apostles are being questioned by some religious authorities, Right? They had been doing healings and miracles in the name of Jesus, and their fellow Jewish leaders were not very happy about this because it kind of put the death of Jesus onto them. Right? The text, the text reads, when they had brought them, the apostles, to stand before the, the council, the high priest questioned the apostles, saying, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, and yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. 
God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So, first of all, these guys are under the assumption that they are obeying God and not human authorities. But they're also under the assumption that repentance and forgiveness of sins is only available and for the Israelites, for the Jewish people. Why? Because, because they have not yet experienced the conversion of the first Gentile, right? This is still just a Jewish movement. And so they are convinced that the repentance and forgiveness of sins offered through Christ is still only for their people. And yet they speak as if this authority, right, like this knowledge that they have is one that's otherworldly. So even though our text, so even though in our text the apostles say that they they only bow to God and not to human authorities, they're certainly still bowing to human authorities, you know, like their upbringing, their current earthly knowledge, their own biases, uh, their own will. And they're not doing this vindictively, and they're not acting out in a cruel way, right? But the authority that they've been given by Christ to heal and to spread the gospel certainly does not make them less human or more holy or more correct and certainly not less problematic. And then the scripture ends with this line, and we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him, which is also kind of strange and problematic, seeing as the apostles think that the followers of Jesus, or certain folk of the God that they worship, have a special knowledge and special relationship with God, you know, way more special than the religious leaders they're talking to. As in, a, as in only some people get to have the spirit that's clearly us and clearly not you. I mean, come on. Have, has anyone in this room ever met someone um, who thought they were a better Christian than you and had that conversation, right? Someone who thought that they had more answers than you? It's kind of annoying, and it's definitely arrogant. And uh, I mean, it's arrogant to think that God made you more capable of being in relationship with God than others. Or that like, if you only, if they only like, well, you know, if you thought more like me, then you could be in a better relationship with God. You can be just as worthy as I am. It's arrogant to think that a creator has not only picked favorites, but that, but that you're one of them because your gifts and talents that God gave you are just simply more appreciated by God than those of your neighbor. It is arrogant to assume that God's creative grace has found a way into your heart but couldn't possibly find its way into another person's heart. I think about the second hit, the uh, opening hymn that we, ha- that we sang, that the second verse has this arrogant line about how we'll get to be the victorious one and, and how our foes will be stomped on because we have Christ, right? It's arrogant it's arrogant, and it shows, it shows how amazingly gracious God is, that the Spirit can still work through all of our junk and all of these biases and ideas and still bring about the kingdom of God. It's arrogant, and yet it's the truth of the experience of the apostles. I imagine that if I got to speak to those apostles, you know, like now, <laughs> about those those first days and and the first disciples, and I got to ask them about their ministry, I feel like the first thing they'd say would be like, mistakes were made for sure, right? Mistakes were made. That's probably true for, for all people who have been in ministry, leading others and following Christ. Mistakes have been made for sure. And maybe for those particular religious leaders that the apostles were talking to, right? Their mistakes probably included being passive and allowing an innocent rabbi to be executed on a tree. An embarrassing death in that day through crucifixion or in recent American history through lynching. But if those religious leaders really knew, like if they had really, really known who Jesus was or what this Holy Spirit was capable of doing through his followers, you know, I imagine that they too would say something like, mistakes were made. Horrible, horrible mistakes were made. It just strikes me as odd and difficult 
and yet kind of beautiful, how this text is a witness to the work of the Holy Spirit in the world. You know, in in a few chapters, these same disciples are going to learn that Jesus actually came for all people, Gentiles as well as those in their community. In fact, the very idea of community is going to change. And yet the lack of the current knowledge doesn't hinder the spirit, and that's amazing. It's amazing that even if I'm arrogant or broken or filled with my own half-truths or my own problems, even if I'm not perfect, that the spirit of God is able to work through me and in the world and in anyone for that matter. And that's powerful. And I think what really makes it, make it, makes it powerful is because it's not coercive. Think about that. Like, the spirit doesn't, like, overtake who we are. It's not like some brainwashed moment, right? It's not some controlling entity. The spirit meets us where we are and uses us exactly as we are to bring about the will of God in the world. Because love and grace, these things are not coercive either. They can't be. They can't be. You can't point to a God who's loving and also say that that God is controlling. The book of Acts is this amazing collection of stories from the early, early church about how God is working in the world through broken, well-meaning people who, when inspired by the non-course of love of the Holy Spirit, can change the entire course of human history. And it's not like it was easy for them either. These guys are constantly landing themselves in jail. A lot of them are martyred and killed for their beliefs. Because, because once you get a taste of that truth, that non coercive love of God, and once you see it working in the world through the Spirit, and once you see the body of Christ and that community that gathered because of the life of Christ, there's just nothing else like it. In the scriptures, in the Bible, from the very beginning until the end, Okay? We have a witness of a God who, whose idea of God's people, right, of God's chosen people, expands more and more over time. This story, our story, was written down by those people who have witnessed God's love and the idea of who God's people really is expand more and more over time. The story of Acts is yet another story of that continuation of a God that expands around more and more people over time, which gives me hope. The non of nature of the triune God is one that has historically been on a path of liberation from the beginning. God has constantly and always been expanding to liberate more and more people, more and more communities since the beginning of time, to wrap her arms around us and to find a way to bring us back together. Thus, the work of the Spirit is the continued liberation of all people who suffer from injustice and from disconnect, from a lack of community. The liberating acts of God draw us back into community and back into relationship with God and with each other and with the world. We reflect this in communion, right, where we're all invited to the table, even those who may feel outside or because of race or gender, economics or other reasons, may actually be outside of the accepted community of that time and place. And we see this. We see this reflected in the book of Acts as the triune God through the Holy Spirit continues to widen the knowledge and hearts of the disciples and their understanding of who God's people really are. And that's the hope for us too, right? That our hearts can continue to be expanded, that our community can grow wider and deeper, that we can be forever changed, that we can be forever loved and learn how to love better. Because in the realm of the Spirit of God, none of these people around us are meant to be outside of the community. In the realm of the Spirit of God, none of the people around us are meant to be outside of the community. Amen.
for our time of reflection today. I encourage you to say a prayer for a person that you know that you did not want to welcome into your community this week or into your heart.